Ask not for we are be can do for you. Ask what you can do for we all be. And we just dap in Molly. We're quasi fossil. I was going to call it the Bill Cosby. That's why I call it. I call it the Cosby. <laughs> you got to make a song about the Cosby. But that's, that's the brother. That's the homie. That's the cuzzo. Quasi Fapo with Dop and Molly. And we're going to have this man on. This guy was phenomenal. I really enjoyed this brother. He's my cousin, but he is so talented. He's like a cross between a a younger and hungrier Kanye West. He's like even more creative, talented creator. There's so many things. You just got to check this stuff out to believe it. It really moves your spirit. It really grooves your soul. Without further ado, I bring to you the one and only, none one like this other, this phenomenon. This is brother quasi Fawful. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? I'm good, man. You're such a humble guy. I really enjoy your music, man. I it kept me up while I was driving back home from Michigan and stuff. <laughs> I really enjoyed the music. You are so talented. You doing all right? Yeah, bro. I'm doing real good, man. I'm glad to be home, man. How you? Hey, I'm a couple of days, so. Oh yeah, man. It, it, it's on to have you back. I mean, have you on for hopefully many more times. And I just want to say that you know I was truly amazed when I went up to New York City uh, to see the film festival. And to see the, the the just really the respect that people have for your work as a creative individual and also as a person really made me proud. And I just want you to let the people know who is Quasi Fossil. What is this Quasi Fossil thing? Or who is Quasi? Man, you know, to, to be real, I don't even really know, man. That's just you know, it kind of came about. The name came from a notebook I had uh, written down one day. I picked it up, and I don't know. I guess been something I ate today. I don't know something that was happening that day. I was like, it seemed like something to rock with. You know, I've been rocking with it ever since. It's been about uh, about it was two years now. You know, and um, as far as me even doing the music, you know, as far as doing movies and stuff, that's been, been about four years now. So you know, it's just starting out pretty fresh. You know, still getting my legs with it. So it's all good. So what what inspired you first? Was it the music or was it the movies like film film over music? Or or it was um. Well, in terms of the music, it was I was sitting down one day and I was listening to uh, one of my favorite rappers, Currency. And um, he, you know, he had a song, and he had a song called Hennessy Beach. And uh, on the track, you know, he's just he's talking about his day. He's sitting at the beach. He was writing some lyrics, you know. And nothing really too crazy happened with the whole day, you know. What I mean, he's just pretty much sitting at the beach, you know, he, you know, just smoking, chilling. He got it, he got his favorite shoes on. And I was just sitting there. I was like, man, that seemed like, you know, I, I wish I could do that every day, you know, pretty much just chill. And uh, you know, I mean, he works hard. You know, people work hard and things they work hard at, but. Don't necessarily mean you have to be unhappy. So, you know, I figured I was going to spend all my time doing that and we'll see see what happens with that. Well, I think the thing about it is what I like about you, you have a chill type of person, personality. But I also know that you're a hard worker, man. I know you're a prolific person. Like, you work hard in the studio and outside the studio as well. I mean, it's really honing your craft and it's showing it because you got a, you got a following, right? You got a, you got a little small devoted following there up in New York City. Or, I mean, you know, in terms of, I, I wouldn't even know, I guess. It, the people, I know a lot of people that, that did hear the project, you know, they uh, they rocking with it. And that's mostly because, you know, they, you know, some way or another people helped inspire. You know, same thing like you said when you came to see, uh, with the film stuff, you know, a lot of people have, like, a lot of nice things to say. You know, a lot of that's about making other people look good, you know, and it's about making other people feel good. And, you know, if people can all be involved, you know, realize, you know, the Quality Fopper Show is a community interactive event. You know, I definitely feel like you can find something, you know, you can really enjoy out of it. Because, you know, I have my professors call me quasi. You know, I, I work at a yoga studio. They call me quasi there. Only person that really don't call me quasi is my mama. And, uh, you know, for the most part, I don't, don't really, you know, explain too much why my name is quasi. My name, my real name is Nicholas. and has really nothing to do with quasi. You know, but I figured, <laughs> why not? You know, like, you know, if you can say your name is quasi, nobody questions it, you know, more power to you. So that's kind of how. You know, I wanted the tone of the album to be. That's just, you know, kind of how I've been living life as of late. And, you know, it's been working out. You know, who knows what's going to do tomorrow. Well, I want to give a shout-out to your mom, Auntie Vanessa, for doing a great job. And she got all her own thing going on. She got some style going on over there oh, as well. Yeah. She's styling out herself. Yeah, so. I'm I, I, right now. I said, wow, okay. I, I mean, I want to ask you this, like, 
Uh, how has your family influenced you, like coming from the family, the type of family that you have? How has that influenced you as a person and also as an artist? Well, you know, looking at my cousin Ryan, clearly the art, you know, is in the family, so that's what's up, you know, off the top. <laughs> then, uh-huh. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, my dad, he's a real cool dude. He's real chill. they they both social workers, so, you know, they be talking a lot. They're they real good at listening, you know, and being receptive, so that was always helpful. And, you know, my mom, you know, she loved to travel. Like, you know, she uh, she traveled with her work. She traveled, you know, and she trying to have fun. You know, she said one time when uh, she was younger, I guess, you know, she got robbed or something like that. I like got her house, and, you know, they took a lot of her possessions. So, you know, after that, she decided, you know, she wasn't going to really spend her time and her money on, you know, on possessions because, you know, they were real temporary. Yeah. So she's been traveling ever since, and then that she kind of instilled that same idea in me just in terms of, you know, you don't you take the things you got, but, you know, you go somewhere with those things. You know, if you can go somewhere, you know, you can make a lasting impression that's probably a little bit longer than maybe something that you would hold on to and you, you yourself would only enjoy, maybe, maybe only in your own house. Oh, definitely, man. That's some deep stuff. You come from good people, man. Uh, shout out to Uncle Herb. He did a great job as well. I really enjoyed talking to your yeah. your mom and dad. You know, the fruit don't fall too far from the tree. Definitely, man. They, they, mm-hmm. Well, speaking of traveling, you got some traveling coming up. I mean, I know. I want to get your take on the big news about the Cuba stuff that happened earlier today. And yeah, I know I'm you got some business down there. Cuba on the radio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're going to Cuba. Um, we're going to Cuba next month. Uh, so like a little cultural exchange. You can only really go to Cuba for like arts and cultural exchanges. So that's you know that's kind of how it's built. So we're gonna do some cultural exchanges. I got the song called Siesta. I want to shoot part of it there. You know. Oh, that's uh, a good song. Yeah. It just seems, yeah, it just seems very rare, very, very culturally relevant to the song. So I think it'll be dope. Actually, I'm gonna put these songs inside the the, the interview once we get done. Cause I just wanted to just. Take this time for you to talk about what you do, man, because your music is phenomenal. And I just can't really wait to see what you come back out to Cuba. What you got going on after that, man, because your production's off the chain, man. And I want to say this, too, because you're a very humble dude, man. You got folks already in the industry. You haven't even graduated from NYU. You already got people like Whoopi Goldberg and, and BET already using you. I mean, you're a professional already. Well, you know, I, you know I, I guess that's the only reason to really be out here. Otherwise, you know, I could... I'd be back in Michigan because I, you know, I love Michigan. And, you know, New York got its own pace. But I guess the big you know, the big reason they'd be here is to, you know, capitalize on this stuff. Cause, you know, it's just, at the end of the day, all this stuff is just a job. So somebody, I mean, somebody got to do it. So, you know, it might as well be you or it might as well be me, I guess. <laughs> right. In this case. Mm-hmm. But, but everybody don't have, like, you know, what makes you, why do you think that people are so interested in having you work on their projects, especially when it relates to the music and the sound? What is it about what you do that, that stands out? Mhm. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's really just about listening, you know, because like you know I'm the sound person, like I'm the you know at school, you know, and how I build myself, I'm like the sound guy. So, you know, a lot of you know, you know, rap is you know rap is cool, and you know the quality follow show is cool because it gives me a chance to really speak and you know not be interrupted by anybody in terms of you know like I'm talking, you have to listen in terms of just how you know just terms of how the how the platform you know music is. But, you know, in terms of actually doing sound for other people, in terms of, like, going on film sets, recording sound, the the, the less people notice you is the more, you know, people appreciate you because you, you, you're supposed to be listening. You're supposed to be aware of, like, problems that are happening. And, you know, people want them problems solved before they have to start dealing with it. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, people be like, man, Claus, you're, like, you're a wizard for doing all this. This what seems like amazing stuff, you know, but it's, it's a lot of it's just being proactive. You know, and, and and being reactive. You know, you see something happens. You, you know, you, you fix it real quick, and that's that's what I'm about, really. I'm just about observing what you know what needs to be done. If we need, you know, if we need to put like a boom, you know, a boom just in terms of film, you need to you need, you need to do one position here. I'll do it. But even if I'm if I'm building something else, if the job needs to get done, like you know, you can't you can't you can't really have your ego involved. You just kind of got to handle it. So you know, working as a team and just you know just making other people look good kind of is always going to get you a job. Like, you know, if you, you know, in basketball, if you can pass, if you can get somebody else to score, they always going to pick you up. So, you know, that's just kind of how I've been playing, you know, in New York. Yeah, well, like, you know, to me, like, I, I like that. Like, you, you're very humble. You're a team player. But when I see things like, let's say, for example, your video of the program, to me that's a very powerful mm-hmm. piece, man. You can play from both ends. You're, you're like a five-tool player, right? You know, like you can win all types of ways. You're not only a role player, but when you need to be, you could be the franchise player. So I just want to talk about that mm-hmm. Prism video. I mean, I, I'm just so uh, inspired and intrigued by it. I mean, 
the way you carry yourself, man, you like you just what that what is that? What's the concept behind that? Uh, uh Pilgrim? The, in, yeah. In terms of all that. Well, I, I I was reading a lot about pilgrims. I was reading about this lady. Her name is Peace Pilgrim. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she got a real government name, but she she never really announced it and she never went by it. You know, she went by her name her name was Peace. You know, her full mm-hmm. name was Peace Pilgrim and I was re- reading about her. She walks she walked America for about twenty eight years with nothing in her possession but just the things on her back. You know, she you know, she her book is pretty much about her living just a, a great, happy life, just not being bought down by things. You know, she said, you know, if she ever wanted to travel, it was just as simple as getting up and walking away. And that's that's kind of what I want to model it out of. And also I just want to, you know, kind of model, like, just, just the idea of duality, you know, and, and how, you know, you can you can, you can can be all these, these facets at once because, you know, the hook goes like, you know, the song is called Pilgrim because, you know, the good thing about Pilgrims was they really helped out a lot of people. And those people to being, you know, like, you know, white settlers, you know, so if, if you're, you know, if you're part of the white settling community of the time, you know, being a pilgrim, you look up to that person, that person's a hero to you, but at the same mm-hmm. time, it's the same person that killed a lot of, you know, killed Native Americans, so that he's, you know, he's a criminal, and that's, that's just kind of, well, you know, that's just kind of the way, the duality that, you know, every, we all got to face, kind of, like, some people are going to like you for a lot of things, those same very things, you know, you could be hated for, so. Just kind of like, just like Peace Pilgrim, you just gotta gotta keep walking, gotta keep moving. Uh, that's, that's deep right there. You were saying all that. And I was just thinking about uh, America. Like I was thinking about Dick Cheney, you know, TV a couple of days ago. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh about the CIA torture that. Yeah, I engineered that. I did all that. But you know, but some people will paint these folks as heroes. But then I like to talk about duality. I love that. Like it's all about in the eye of the beholder. And I like the fact that you had a way to to really put your stamp on that narrative. You took control of that narrative and, and reinvented it. I mean, you just flipped it. Oh, my phone dropped. You, you said what was the last part you said? Cause? I said you had a way to flip the narrative. Like you really took hold of that narrative, put your own stamp on it. And I think that's the power of art oh. to be able to reinvent yourself. And to recreate a narrative from your own likeness. It's almost it's like being a god. In a sense. <laughs> that's like that's pretty good. and that's you know, and that's that's, that's one of you I guess you say it like that too, 'cause you know, like you're saying like a lot of people give me you know, they always tell me like, I'm very humble and stuff, which I and I, I find it funny 'cause I already find it to be I don't really know if I'm really that humble. Like, you know, if, even if you look at the song Pilgrim, you know, I, I mean you got lyrics in there, but you can probably hear the word quasi. <laughs> you know, you might hear the word quasi you know, like three times. <laughs> so even though it's about, you know, the, the, the tone of it's like for all these people and you got the kids, you see the kids there and you see me like um like throwing on Thanksgiving, you know, dinner and stuff, it's still kinda of centered around me, you know, and that's it's kind of uh, it's kinda of fucked up, you know what I mean? In the in the in the sense of like I I gotta live my life so you know, you make your life about yourself and you include other people so other people feel good and you know, in that way the attention is less on on me, you know what I mean. As in, even mm-hmm. though the, even though the song is all about quiet and you hear quasi a million times, it's really not about me. Even though it's from my perspective, so inevitably I, I, it's gonna be about me. You know what I mean? In my in my position in that situation. Most definitely, man. And also, I want to ask you this. I mean, speaking of that, because I think it's so important. I had saw the uh, the Illmatic documentary that was done by Showtime on Nas. I thought it was pretty pretty good. Have you seen that? Yeah, uh-huh. And it reminds me what you just said is about you because it's it's your life. You, this is your your life you live in. And so I want to ask you, what who are your influences from a hip hop or rap point of view on what you're doing right. musical? Mm-hmm. In terms of well, in terms of all music, my you know, my number one artist is Erica Badu. I, you know, I love Erica Badu. That's she in terms of hip hop, in terms of soul, in terms of all that. She she definitely my number one influence. I would mm. say. And um, in terms of you know MCs and things like that. Listening to the you know to this project, this project took the quasi five for sure. It took about two, it took two summers and a winter, and mm-hmm. so the majority of that I listened to was um, based on a true story part two by Two Chainz. That was mm-hmm. you know because you know so much music comes out all the time, and you know it's easy to have a favorite album one week and then next week somebody else's album come out. But I was really trying to stick to you know finding one piece of work that I liked and really focusing on that. So you know. Um, I pretty much bumped that album every single day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when I wasn't bumping that, I was just bumping, you know, the instrumentals. 
to to the Quasi Fossil show and, and and musically, you know, that came from a lot of stuff that you know my dad. Like you talked about my dad earlier. Shout out to my dad because you know he really responsible for the whole Sonic Scape of the album because he let me take all his records and you know ship them back to New York. I don't know what I would have would have used for influences, but you get you get Lonnie List and Smith as a number one influence in terms of just what he can do. You know, in terms of the jazz, the keys, with with uh, synthesizing and. Mm-hmm. And he and he, he actually really, you know I heard him once he said he don't even like to use a lot of synth, uh, electronic um, instruments because you know he, he likes to see what you can do just manipulating real acoustic instruments to to your liking so I really like the idea of, of of molding and and chopping up sound and that's kind of what I did I tried to do for the album at least you know take a lot of stuff that I would use in film like sound effects but somehow you know add them to kick drums or something you know kind of really mutate both art forms, and that's why I call it the Quasi Five Show because it's an audio project. But you know, we got videos, so that you know that becomes the Quasi Five Show. Like, I'm on, I'm on the radio right now. This, this becomes the Quasi Five Show. You know, we are. All, <laughs> you know, you know, right. You know, it's the Quasi. But, so you know, every you know, and I you know I teach I teach yoga too, and I like to think you know when I gotta go teach these yoga you know teach the yogis that I gotta turn up. You know, it's gotta be the Quasi Five Show, and so. You know, everywhere everywhere I go, I just try to make it the Quasi Five Show. That's been my little. That's been my goal every day. That's cool, man. So you basically like you got, you you you're the life of the party. I mean, everywhere you go, there's a party. You the life of it. You the center of it, of the universe, so to speak, of your own universe. Uh, yeah, definitely. Because I'm a, you know I'm I'm gonna turn up regardless. Like almost every show I I, I did so far, you know, it's been like well, I, I'm not gonna say every show, but majority of the shows it'd be like three people there, it'd be like two people. It might not even be no, but I might be the only person there. And I'm saying that that, that was the best party I've ever been to because it's it's really I'm really not concerned about who show up or who listen or even who really gets it, you know, because I still got to be there, you know what I mean? Like, I got to show up, every, I got to be myself every day, so I might as well, you know, I might as well turn up as much as I can because at the very least, I'm not trying to bore myself, you know, so that's, <laughs> that's, that's right. kind of my attitude about it. Mm-hmm. Well, it makes sense. I, I just think that a lot of times people put too much into numbers and stuff, it really always been about quality. Like, you know, like, all we have right now is this moment in time that we're talking about the quasi Fafo show, and that's all that really matters at this point as it relates to us. Is, you know what's happening with the quasi Fafo show because it's turned up, it's right now, it's live, it's in your face, it's in your ear. Uh, you know we paint these mental images, uh, we're manifesting these these realities, uh, and you know we dealing with the du- duality. And I want to ask you this because I mean, like it's not your stuff. Like what I like about the quasi Fafo show is that you have a certain charm. It's kind of like uh, even like like Stephen Colbert or, or John Stewart, like you could talk about certain things in a way that won't that won't offend people. If that make any sense? Like you could talk about programs and the way, because the way you got everything set up with the music and you know the sounds and whatnot, it's like you you're able to get away with it. <laughs> like people could jam to this. I can see a Bill O'Reilly shaking his head a little bit to some of the stuff that you got out there, and letting some of the other stuff slip by. So what? I, what is that? What is it? Where does that charm come from? Like the ability mm. to charm people. Mm. Uh, I see. I think I get like my mama. She did this thing, and it's it's real irritating when it's like, like you know. I remember I I we I begin arguments with my mom or something, and she wouldn't let me go somewhere or whatever it was. You know, I'd be like, you know, I'd be wanting to pout and this and that, and just you know talk about like you know just just be mad, just sit in my room, and you know she we smiling, and she you know she just be smiling and be like, you still can't go, but like it was a smile. <laughs> and that kind of, you know, just made it so irritating, you know, because it was kind of like you was, you was getting told one thing and you was seeing something else, and you, you know, for I guess me in this, in this that situation, I just wasn't, I was putting a perception on what she was saying. Like I was thinking, you know, she was smiling, you know, this is, but she's telling me this, so now I'm forced to make an assumption on, on what her intentions are. And there was, she was kind of an enigma in that way, and that's kind of how I want to set up the show, because you know, a lot of times you. People say things a certain way, and, and people are so quick to uh, respond before they listen. Kind of like, you know, if your, your teacher has a point, you know, you, you raise your hand before she's done talking. Mm-hmm. And so everything she say after the point of you raising your hand, you, you're not even listening anymore, you know. So like, people already are pretty set on what they ready to hear anyway. So, you know, to take a song like Pilgrim, I wanted it to be very light, you know, very relaxing so you could feel one day, you know, feel one way about it and hopefully enjoy it in that respect. But, you know, also there's a lot of, Underhanded things that that are being said, and if you if you get that, that's just an extra bonus. You know, that's just an extra bonus for you. That's excellent. Do you have a favorite song from uh, season one? 
Early test. Favorite song? Yeah. Um. Uh, let me look at anybody. Oh uh, yeah, hell yeah! I love uh, Voyager Thirteen is my favorite song on that thing. Mm. Voyager Thirteen, because oh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the um, what's it called? It, it kind of embodies the sound I was trying to go for, and I, I like to call it like galactic space rap. Yeah. And that's that's kind of what Voyager Thirteen was was meant to be. It was meant to sound like kind of like an old dirty cassette, you know, got put in a time capsule, and then you know, like thousands of years later, you know, these advanced species, you know, they check out this old school music. And they put a twist mm. on it, you know. So that's why a lot of you know it, it takes a it takes a group actually. Um, one of them is based out in Saginaw, uh, Reynolds. I think his name was Larry Reynolds. It's from the Dramatics. But mm-hmm. yeah, the Dramatics, it was they they had this 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 uh the sample that I chopped for it. And I only I only really use the guitars like a you know just to stab you there. And you know for the rest of it, we use a lot of space sounds. Mm-hmm. We use a lot of stuff we use for for the uh for movies. So you know a lot of it. Uh, that's a real layered song, and I, for me, I really enjoy that, especially for the second verse, because it talks to a white kid who um, I grew up with named Dre. And, you know, we're from different uh, different parts of town, and you know, so he had a lot of experiences that you know I didn't have that he could teach me from, and I also had a lot of experiences that he didn't have. So you know, he learned from me in that way. Mm-hmm. And you know, I was just and I wanted people to to take to take a song like Voyage 13 and have it be very lighthearted initially. But by by the time you get to that second verse about Dre, now other stuff I really want you to have to be forced to listen to it because a lot of the a lot of the music you know that a lot of the the rap especially the rap that gets that people compare my music to is is you know usually like you know it's usually for white audiences like you know you, you know, I get compared to like Tyler Creator a lot and you go to your know, Our Future Show it's the you know majority of it's white audiences you go I mean you go to most deaf show you go to honestly you go to I mean you go to anybody's show just about yeah yeah. Is that but, frustrating? You know, to, like, you said what? Is that frustrating for you to go to the shows or you know you're doing this? You no, know, oh, came from no, black no, people. I don't, I don't care at all. Nah, it's it's cool with me because like that you know take, that's I want I want a song like Virgin Team to be uh, appear like you know it's a time to turn up, but then like you know you force to hear about a lot of black subjects, and the music is still up tempo and the music is still going, but all of a sudden you know the, the speaker the artist is all of a sudden kind of upset. He kind of angry. And he kind of talking about things that they're not really worth turning up about. Like, you know, I, I was just hoping Dre was going to be alive, you know, to see him until Christmas, which was, you know, it was the tone of that second verse. But, you know, the first verse is so meant to have fun. I want people to have to for it. Like, by the time you realize what we're in for, it's already, you know, it's already too late. You're already there. So kind of making people uncomfortable, kind of making people iso- uh, disconnected from the artist was kind of my intent with, with kind of the entire show. Well, actually, this, do you feel like a pressure as a artist of color to speak on the social issues of the day? I know y'all had that large march up in New York City this past weekend, and also people dealing with police brutality and other things going on. Do you feel pressure as an artist, a uh, creative person, to speak about these things? No, no, I don't feel pressure to speak about these things. I feel, if anything, an obligation to enjoy um, the day as much as I can in the sense of, I feel like you know, being at the school I'm at right now, it's uh, it's a lot of people complaining about a lot of things that ain't really worth complaining about to, mm-hmm. to most Americans. You know, you and you got things like Eric Gardner and you got things like Mike Brown happening every day. I'm not really trying to hear you complain about you know the things that I, I hear about all the time. You know, so if you know if Eric Gardner, you know, if, if that was because of the way society set up and the way you know just black men are treated, if that's what his fate had to be. And I get to be in a position to be who I am. Then, I, you know, if anything, I feel pressure to make the most out of that, just to be an example for other people and, and be an example for myself, and you know, and do what I can to help people. Because I, don't, I mean, I'm glad that people are marching, and you, you know, people need to be marching, and that's you know, that's definitely good for the people. And I guess what what I feel I, I can do that's, you know, helpful, you know, helpful in a way that can be helpful is just kind of to the people that I interact to on a daily basis, just make sure that they are aware of the things that they should be aware about. I hear what you say, but I, I just look at the fact that I know I was just thinking about this. I know you're a cradle person. You're into hip hop. I know you're into other stuff as well. But a lot of people have been raising that concern about the lack of, of message music. Like you look at the '60s, you had people like Curtis Mayfield, James Brown, Sam Cooke, even Bob Dylan. You had you know this great all-time great artists really speaking to those times. You know, you could forget about Marvin Gaye, or even you could just you know M W N W A with fuck the police. 
you know, the L.A. riots and stuff like that. It is like, to me, it's interesting. It's like it's a, an awakening in the younger people. Like, it's a different time. Uh, it's a very uh, open time, not just a closed mind. I think it's very open right now. Uh, it could go either way right now. It's going to become extremes on both ends. By the way, I'm just looking at this vacuum of the lack of anybody. But it was, uh, well, D'Angelo, I mean, you know, you're going to come back 14 years. I believe you came back at the right time <laughs> because of the stuff he's putting out there. But even his stuff is not necessarily like they try to say it's political, but his line of notes are political. But his music, in a way, is revolutionary. But it's not necessarily like political, like, you no, know, vote for Barack Obama or, or, or don't vote for Rand Paul. It's nothing like that overtly. But it's just like mm-hmm. it's the act of creating. He said Black Messiah, the act of resurrecting from this world, rising up like a phoenix. The, I think I, what I love the most about being an artist is back to that God thing. You create your reality. You are the center of your universe. You the sun. Mm-hmm. You know, you the light. You mm-hmm. know, so I'm just saying, like, so it's good to know that you still understand who you are, but is it easy to get lost in all of this as you create? Mm-hmm. Is it hard to stay true to who yeah. you are? It, I, I say it becomes hard to, like, to, I think sometimes when you start creating this stuff, you, because, you know, you're super into the ego, you know what I mean? Like, right, exactly. you, you spend this time trying to, like, create who you who you want people to think you are, and then you got to make, mm-hmm. you know, then you got to make a social presence for people to know who you are. Then you spend all the time writing your thoughts, and then you, you know, you, like, you got, at some point, you got to realize that it's very important to you as much as it's not important at all to nobody else, you know, and that's, mm-hmm. that's the one thing to remember, like, if it, if it helps somebody out, that's really good, you know, it's, and it, if your if your intent is to go help somebody, you know, you know, you should really reach out to that person and and make sure that you know that the music or the art you're creating is really reaching that person. And if it reaches, you know, somebody across the world who you never knew, that's also a good thing. But for me, at least, I can't I can't you know make music and hope that somebody I never met appreciates pre, appreciates it because you know I, they got people got things to do every day. You know, people got you know people only have a limited amount of time to even spend time enjoying art. So like. If if I don't enjoy it, it's really it's really for nothing because I may be the only person that even cares to listen to it, you know. And if I'm the only person that cares to listen to it, then I got to make sure it's something that I, you know, that I can relate to myself. I never think that's very it, that's very true. I think it's the only way you can really make a real contribution in a world like this. It got you got to be authentic, authentic and true to yourself. Like to to that own self, be true. You got to be really be true to who you are. Cause I look at people all the time. I have these discussions with people. They said, well, Ron, you just take the shortcut, man. I mean, it ain't, ain't all about doing it the way you want to do it. It's about just get it done. And I said, will you really make a lasting contribution? I'm not saying you actually aim for that, but I look at, you know, what history tells me and what I look at people who did some incredible things in this life, they were very passionate about what they were doing. Uh, they were very passionate. They were very committed to what they were doing. It's like you look at somebody like Emily Dickinson, uh, she wasn't famous until she was dead, and the only reason that any of her stuff got published while she was alive because her friends went into her house and stole her work to get it published. Right. If you look at her poetry, the title of all her poems based by the first line of her poem. That's the title for the poem because she didn't have uh, no title for her poems. Or you look at somebody like Herman Melville, who wrote, um, you know, Moby Dick. It didn't become famous or successful until he was dead. Or you look at even Zora Neale Hurston. She wasn't really appreciated to act she passed years later for the work she was able to leave behind, but she was passionate about that work. She was passionate about collecting the stories of her people, uh, uh, you know, expressing the vernacular of her people. And I just look at the people who do things. I mean, whether it be in sports or entertainment or, or politics, they have a have a passion, you know, to really affect other people. Yeah, you know, cause I, I, you know I agree, especially with the, you know, to the be true part, because you know you don't, you don't ever want to appear disingenuous. Mm-hmm. You know, I think people can pick on that more than anything. Like, I think you know, I think people draw to you when you. Well, I think people draw to you when you being yourself, just because you you giving people enough space for them to be themselves. Like, exactly. You know, you're not trying to, you know, pose as anything. You're not, you're not projecting anything. You know, so you you you, you create that space for somebody to open up how they want to open up. Definitely, and I will actually just like. So where can we expect season two? I really enjoy season one. I got it. <laughs> where can we expect season two? 
Mm-hmm. I just started. Uh, I just finished my last movie today. Actually, you know, my last movie got done today, so I'm back. You know, I'm back. I've been writing ever since, but now I'm back to making production. You know, I just cleaned my space out, got my feng shui how it's gotta be. Mm-hmm. You know, I got my cat right here, so we finna. Me and this cat, we finna just be making beats and chilling all uh, through January. Hopefully, come up with something nice. My uh, one of the person I started making music with, um, dude named C, uh, mm-hmm. Christian Seeley. I, I, I gotta tell him I'm on the radio. That's what's up. I got I gotta hit that dude up. But yeah, he, he, he gonna come up to he gonna come up to New York and we gonna uh, we gonna get some music back up. And one of the first dudes we we actually had a like a, a, a LLC um, a couple of years ago. So it'd be good to you know get back with the people that were in a way mm-hmm. that you know the mm-hmm. the index crew and stuff like that. So we'll we making music right now. And I, I know the season two has been you know it, it, it honestly season one was was about making it anyway, so now I have this, you know, now I have people, now I have this, like, project to show people what the last two summers in the winter was about. So mm-hmm. season two, you know, you, you were really a part of season, you was part of season one. You know, when uh, I made that song, Niggas in the Garden, that was that was straight off what you told me um, when I was in Atlanta about um, knowledge is the currency of the universe, and I, that blew my mind, and that, and that inspired <laughs> me to start writing, and, and that was the first, you know, video I'm going to chop up. So that's, that's some pre that's that's pre season one stuff. And, you know, we you know, I'm always learning something from you. You know, always you know getting more knowledge. So season two is season two is very much you know you coming to see me. You know, with the movie thing, the talks that we had. And that's very much you know season two is you you we we here. You know, we are we are in season two. And in terms of when I get oh, the yeah. project done for the rest of the world to see you know to catch up, I you know I, hopefully you know hopefully one day that that will come out and we'll be working on it constantly. Oh man, it's an honor, man. I mean, I, I'm really enjoying. I get a lot from you. You're a very inspiring individual, man. You're a very like, exceptional person, a human being, and you know you're a decent person. You know you're a great person. But I would like to hope we hear Fidel Castro in season two as well. You could have with Castro yeah. or just a shot of or somebody. I don't know. I mean, this would be awesome. I can't wait. Yeah, to hear. You know. but also, I want to ask you about the, the season one the quality. I, it's the kid, man. Who is that kid on there? I mean, I love the kid, man. The Kwame Papa? Oh, Who is that cat, man? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Who is that person? Oh, that's uh, that's a little palm tree. She, she that's a little palm tree. She in in real life, she's like, she actually um, she actually my age. She's a real dope film director. We just finished up. Oh, really? That's a oh, that's a oh. Yeah. I thought it was a little kid. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. She's on it. She she fully in charge. She she a badass director. She um. She didn't went to jail for her art, you know. She came back out, you know. She she really go, she really worked hard for what she fought, where she worked hard. Oh wow! And, um, yeah, I, I caught her, I caught her on a good day. She felt like representing the quality Fafa show, so I was glad that we got to have that time to make that happen. That was beautiful, man. That's art, man. I really enjoyed it. I, the fact that you can use your art to connect you with people, like the relationships that come out of just sharing your passion with art, is worth all the trouble. It's worth it. I mean, like, the people you were able to meet, man. Because, like, I'm actually just, like, you know, when you first came to New York to go to school and where you at now, did you see yourself in this position four years ago? Um, I definitely see myself this this confident. I, I was definitely this confident. Maybe not even in my, not because of anything I was thinking I was about to do, but just because everybody had so many expectations, not even in a bad way, not even, expectations with pressure, but just everybody was just so excited, you know, like I'm, you know, really I'm the only person in my friend group, maybe say a few people that could even be doing this stuff, you know, and people was just excited, you know, I mean, people was like, oh, you are you finna go to New York? I like, you know, turn up, so, and that's, that's been my that's been my attitude ever since, you know, I could really give a damn what people in New York feel because I know that people back home is just, you know, really happy that I'm here. And and they know that like I you know, I carry them with me you know everywhere I go like when I when I come home I find myself maybe a little bit quieter because I, I I'm just observing what my friends you know just just taking in these people that help really build me to where I am right now you know I'm I'm, a, I'm some percentage of all the people that I really love and care about and I you know I try to bring their personalities out and bring their ideas out to people in New York so you know a lot of people in New York have been treating me like treating me like a, kind of like a foreigner. And that's probably because, like, you know, I carry myself like I'm a foreigner. You know, I, I don't really bother to explain stuff. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I make inside jokes with people that have no idea what I'm talking about because, you know, I <laughs> I, know, I feel like somewhere in the world, my homies is laughing at it. You know, like somewhere in the world, somebody know what I'm talking about, and that's that's good enough for me. Mm-hmm. 
I do it for you, but everybody's a foreigner, for the, so to speak, in New York. This is a very transient oh, city. Hell yeah. I mean, everybody from somewhere else. I mean, most people I think that's there are not from there. But so do you feel like you're a New Yorker at all? I mean, you've been there long enough, in my opinion. So you don't really feel like a New Yorker. Yeah, I feel like a New Yorker when, in the sense that you see crazy shit happen and you don't <laughs> even really text nobody you know, about it or you don't really post it on Facebook. And it, it's almost like it's not even crazy. You could just see some wild stuff happen. And you know you'd be on your way to work, and you just like, oh okay, and you you know you just keep walking. Like that's I think that's what New York is. New York reminds you that you know nothing is really out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, it's, I never get that feeling too, man. Because like it's like one of them places that people always talk about it's so expensive, and uh, it's like things you could do without even spending a dime. It's just like just mm-hmm. people watching, mm-hmm. man. It's like it's a, a playground for grown people. It's like. I mean, even your chances of getting some women increased this big <laughs> getting like a dime, you know? <laughs> you might get a nickel back home, but then you, you, your chances of getting like a dime increases. <laughs> Not because they think you're dumb, but it's just, it's just one of those places, man. I just think that, I know a guy told me there when I was there back in November, he said, you know, if you want to make it in New York, walk around like you own the place. And it's like to me that you're very comfortable. I know you say people treat you like a foreigner. It's like you're very comfortable there. Like you walk around, like you know, especially NYU, the, the tissue. You like you own the place, and people respect you as a person who's a standout in that community and a go-to guy. Mm-hmm. And I saw that firsthand, which was impressive. Yeah, I, you know, I, I really do feel like you know, once, whatever you're saying is becomes true once you say it. You know, it's like you know, mm-hmm. I walk in like I'm the man. I I instantly have become the man because I got enough balls to walk in like I'm the man. You know, and and that. Not even not talking about necessarily me, but just with anything, you know. That's what, the people I really respect are people that just kind of like that's how it is, and that's how it's going to be, and until until further notice, and that's that's how they rock. Yeah, definitely, and you give respect, and respect is given back to you. It's like, what is one thing you would like to do? Uh, that's one thing that's like maybe on your bucket list that you'd like to achieve mm-hmm. before you out, you know, make your grand exit. Yeah. Oh, I would like. I would like everybody that I know, or at least they they even especially people that don't really know me that personally, but just they see me quite often. I would like them to like be significantly less negative, just for having like a quirkier perspective on on a situation. You know, like um, mm-hmm. you know, you could you could. I had a lot of things today that I guess I, I you know I've been I just got home. I ain't been home in a couple of days. I sleep on the subway. I got arrested by some cops just for hopping over the subway, so I'm stupid. Then I was stupid, oh, really? right? I was, and I got yelled at my boss. But I had a really good, you know, I had a really good day today just because, like, you know, just in terms of perspective, I didn't, I definitely didn't have the worst day out of everybody in New York. I, I didn't even have the worst day out of everybody in my, you know, my immediate community. So really, like, you know, whatever, I, you know, I was complaining about it. in context of what some people have to go through today, you know, and, and you know, in context of what, you know, people got to go through tomorrow, like, I just I would just hope the people that you know have talked to me they know they they remember that before they you know they start you know feeling negative about whatever's happening with them. I mean that's deep what you just said, man. Because I, I, I it is so important what you said because really it, it stops you from being a victim in this system. They like to make us people look like us victims. I think it's very powerful what you just said. I think people need to hear that and really understand and really just take a hold. Cause I just think it's so important because I think. For me, I had adopted something the mantra is it's not what happens to you, it's how you respond to what happens to you that makes the difference. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of bad things, like you said, that could happen to you. It won't be the worst, but if you could survive it, you could learn from it. And not only learn from it, you could thrive from it. Like all the stuff that you have done to, because it's how you get your wisdom. Like I told somebody uh, recently, uh, a relative of ours, that like, you know, I don't learn things by always reading books. I learned it through trial and error. That's how you develop wisdom. I survived it. I learned from it, and I could thrive from it. But I just, to me, I'm not, I'm not the type of dude that, even though I like knowledge, and I, I'm not going to read the same book more than twice. I don't really need other me. I just like, okay, it's an experience. Okay, let me put that in my, in my vocabulary, in my bank, in my vernacular, whatever like that. Uh, but my thing is this: is like, like what we talked about earlier, being true to who you are to make your most authentic contribution. And really, when it's all said and done, 
it's not about anybody else. It's about can you forgive yourself in order to 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 really make the most of your potential. Mm-hmm. I mean, can you mm-hmm. practice the art of forgiveness on yourself? Because a lot of things that that I have learned recently, even I didn't know that I had affected a person in a in a negative way. But there's nothing I can really do about it. That's the past. I didn't know about it, but I will hope that I I create an air or an energy that'll be conducive to people being honest and transparent with me, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then and I could be able to be yeah. honest and transparent with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now that's like you know to, to resolve the things you can resolve, so you can just kind of let them go. You know, I think a lot of times I see this a lot when I'm um, when I'm teaching too. Mm-hmm. Uh, like teaching people uh, at the yoga studio, like they'll they'll be in some alignment and a pose, and they'll be like some real strenuous, be working the legs, working the arms, the abdomen, and they'll be they'll really be fighting to hold onto this pose when they really kind of did all the work they kind of got to do. Like that's you know like you know people they be, they in pretty good physical shape, like they, you know they align themselves how they need to align themselves. You can actually spend this time just just standing you know standing still in that position and just breathing. But, you know, a lot, you know, and you see that in everyday people's lives, people are always, like, constantly, like, tensing up, gearing up for something that they maybe already have won. Like, you know, sometimes you got to just give yourself, you know, not be so hard on yourself. Be like, you know, you kind of you kind of killed it as much as you could have killed it. So, mm-hmm. like, you know, you take a minute to enjoy that, you know, like, because you tension up, you you about to miss this whole moment, getting ready for another one. And you ain't appreciate, you haven't even appreciated any of the moments you've been in yet. So, you know, just. You let things come one at a time, but, like, when they come, just, like, make sure you really let them shine. That's a wisdom right there. I like that. I think people need to hear that. I think it's very important. So, like, what are some other things? Do you see yourself, like, doing your own feature length film as well, like getting through that side, directing mm-hmm. side? Mm-hmm. I feel like I got one film. I feel like I got one film in me that I really want to wanna um, wanna direct. And it's not even like it's a, it's a very concrete film at the moment, but I just know, you know, I, like you know, it's all this, all this, uh, um, all this, well, uh, all these, all this art is just like you know, different mediums. These are just different currencies for like just how to express yourself creatively. And like you know, I spent all this time around these film people. You know, I I do sound, so that you know, that way I am, I'm I'm a filmmaker. That's how I, you know, I make the audio of the films. And you know, I figured you know, I could, you know, the RZA can do it. I like the RZA. You know, maybe I can right. do it. Maybe I could make a movie one time. You know. You know, I, I, I guess I, I couldn't see why not. You know, if if I, end up, you know, if I spend enough time doing it, I guess I could do it. You know, and it ain't, yeah. it ain't necessarily yeah. random. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now listen. Oh yeah, no, it's, you know, I feel, cause I feel like you know, you could, you like, you know, as much time as I know you spend on jazz and painting. If like in the alternate universe you had an NPC instead of those things, I'm pretty sure that you know, some of the art you made would have been a crazy beat. You know, like. Yeah, like I be trying to think of what that picture. The it's like I think it's like it's like do it on the trumpet. You did it's like one eye. It's the one. You got like the one eye. It's the picture you. Uh, it's a painting you painted. That I got you know. Um, sitting in my girl's dorm room now. But like mm-hmm. you know, just to match like that's that's just a lot of creative energy and that and it was presented in that painting form. You know, so that's that's really cool to see. And so I you know I try to take what that looks like and I try to make a beat that sounds like the world that that painting came from, you know, that type of thing. I love that. Wow, that's awesome, man. That's, a, that's powerful. I mean, I love music. I love sound. I definitely get where you're going with it, man. And this is why I appreciate what you're doing with the with the Prism video and the other videos you have done, like with the soundscapes and all that stuff. I mean, that's so powerful. I think we as, especially for black people, I think it's so important that we understand the value of art as being such a, a powerful, empowering tool for us as people. And also as in, as individuals, because you get to take some of that power back that's been leaving your grasp ever since you got into this system. I mean, because you get to, to you can heal yourself through sound. Uh, you can heal yourself through a lot of things through the arts, but especially sound, the vibrations and stuff like that. You know, you know about that. I mean, you're a doctor when it comes to that type of stuff. We got a Dr. Dre for example. <laughs> he knows a lot about sound. But I'm saying it's just like stuff that we can use. Like people talking about. For example, well, they got tanks. Well, you no, know, Hannibal used elephants. Mm-hmm. The elephants inspired them to make the quote unquote tanks. Which is more powerful, man or nature? Right. You know, right. you know, you know what came first, like the chicken or egg, whatever. But who's more powerful? Who, 
who ends up winning, winning in the end? Who's the person that wins? Because you even look at, you talk about the Pilgrims, you talk about even George Washington, the, uh, the, the first president or whatever of this country. He lost more wars than he, or he lost more battles than he won. Yeah, he still won the Revolutionary War. So if you gotta understand, like in baseball, you could get three hits out of ten at bats and still be an all star. You're hitting thirty percent of the time. Mm-hmm. You're batting three hundred, mm-hmm. but batting three hundred and that contact or hitting or connected thirty percent means you you're making an A. You pass the class. Wow. You're an all star. Mm-hmm. So that's all about mm-hmm. context and all about control of that narrative. I think that's a piece mm-hmm. that a lot of us are missing right now. Now I dig that heavy, yeah. I dig that real heavy because I mean, we, like you said, with man nature, I mean, we all got to lose eventually. It's a, and yeah. It really turned up when it was time to turn up, you know. Yeah, we all do lose. So we we all got to die. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> but if you do what you're doing, you can cheat death, mm-hmm. though. What you're doing, you can cheat death. Yo, word. You word. cheat death. When you Yo. sell your ideas and shit, you cheat death. Mm-hmm. You live forever. Mm-hmm. Now you have to know your name. You live forever. Yo, yeah, I, yeah, I really do love that. Come on, I, mean, I don't know who's, I don't know even know who said it, but they had me thinking that um, what they say? They was like, you know, we all got the opportunity to die, mm-hmm. and some of us never will. I was like, yeah. word, that's, that's true. That was wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I ask you this, man, before you go, cause I mean, I just, I'm just fascinated because like, I want to know. I know I'm gonna ask some corny questions, but I gotta know this. Like, if you could choose to have dinner with three people living that day, who would they be? Dinner with three people living or dead? Yeah. They could be either living or dead. Yeah. It don't make a difference. Uh huh. Um right now, at this moment it'd be my mama, my homeboy Martin, and uh Lil D. Lil D. Oh, I like that. That's a good. <laughs> you are good with the answer, man. You you are a pro at this. <laughs> like what's been the most surprising uh response from your work like? Like who? Like what person that surprised you the most about your work? I mean, anybody in particular? Yeah, oh, like, Aunt Kathy, <laughs> my Aunt Kathy, she's the most surprising about my work. Okay, <laughs> without a doubt, because um, because I, I got you know I got the two videos. One is Pilgrim, one is Dapper Molly. And yeah. you know it's funny like when you got a, you got an idea for to to make something, you got to just be aware of the fact that when you actually go to create it, it's gonna be way different. Mm-hmm. So, um, you yeah, know, so Dapper Molly, which is like. It, the whole concept, the whole original idea of it was trying to make a parody on, like, a California white girl and the, the danger. Oh, yeah, like, I love it. The danger of black male bodies. So that was mm-hmm. the issue it was supposed to be, right? And, and whether that got translated or not, I don't know. But I just know by the end, it's just really raunchy. Like, it's just explicitly raunchy. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. really raunchy. And then I remember my uh, uh, Aunt Kathy, um, she was like, um, she because she, Pilgrim and Dr. Molly, she seen them both, like, I guess, in the same day. Mm-hmm. And she was like, yo, I seen a Pilgrim video, and, you know, the Pilgrim video is it's pretty, it's, it's PG-13 pretty much. Like, nothing really too crazy in there. Um, so I was like, but, you know, I'm still kind of nervous. It's my, my aunt, like, hearing me cuss and just not be a little kid. So I was like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, glad you've seen it. And she's like, I've seen the Daffy Molly video. And I was like, oh, oh, the Daffy Molly video. And she was like, I like that one too. And I was like, wow, okay, this I got a cool family. <laughs> well, it's, it's good stuff, man. I mean, the Dr. Bottle was my favorite. I, that should be Bill Cosby's answer. I'm not saying that he did it, but I was thinking about Bill Cosby. <laughs> yeah. but I just said, so yeah. now, I ain't thinking about Bill yeah. Cosby. Yeah. But it reminded me of, even when, like, yeah. you know, for example, like, we, the way you did it versus how Rick Ross got in trouble like a year or so. You know when Rick Ross got in trouble? Yeah. He dropped that line about, you know, giving the girl Molly or whatever. But the way you did it is, like, he's like, like, go ahead. I was yeah, no, no, I was, I was agreeing because I mentioned Rick. I was trying to mention Rick Ross in the beginning of the song. That was just a little play on that. Yeah, but the way you could get away with it though—that's the thing. You can't get away with. Like you got to worry about you, man. Like you like the spook that stepped out the door. You able to infiltrate <laughs> the system, man. Like, you can get in there, man, and do some damage <laughs> with your art. That's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I really hope so. You know, I really, I'm really glad you think that too. I'm just. Trying to make it as genuine when possible. And sometimes, you know, being genuine just means that, like, she doesn't add up how it's supposed to add up. But, you know, that's, that's, that's life, though. Sometimes. That's how it is. Mm-hmm. 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 Now, what's the best way we could find out? I mean, listen to the, like, you know, if you want to listen to the Quasi Fossil Show and be a part of this movement, yeah. what do I, we need to do? Um, 
Yeah, um, if you go, if you click the the whole Quasi Fossil Show season one, it's on it's on SoundCloud. You put mm-hmm. SoundCloud, you put Quasi Q U A Z Z Y, and you put an exclamation point. I should pop up. It, you should meet my hands up in the air. Um, uh, you know, speaking of Bill Cosby, it really sucks because like I like two years ago I had this whole Bill Cosby concept album, and like my Twitter name is still see like I was, you know I need your advice on this. My Twitter name is Bill Cosby because it always <laughs> it is, always has been. It's been like that for like years. I don't uh-huh. want to change it now. I like, I mean, I feel like I got to. You know, I don't. I don't people seeing thinking I'm trying to like uh, make light of uh, a heavy situation. But I mean, I really do like the Cosby Show. I mean, I was really about to make that concept album. So, I, do I change the Twitter name? Because right now it's at Bill Quas. Is, is that something I change? Do I do I keep that? Do what? Well, well, well look, oh, look at for example, look at what Rick Ross did with the name. Who who you, you know the guy who asked the name Rick Ross versus the rapper Rick Ross. You look at stuff. I mean, I think if you as an artist, you have the power to to, to turn shit into gold. You are alchemist. Okay. <laughs> you know, you can turn anything to gold, man. I I, I think that's gold because I'm still a fan of Bill Cosby's work. I mean, you look at this uh, t- like the University of Virginia when they said it was a rape that went down to the University of Virginia. You know, Thomas Jefferson was the founding person of the University of Virginia. He was his first president. So you know, he was a rapist. And he's a hero. It's like the duality you speak about in program. He's a murderer and a rapist, but he's still a hero to so many people. So Bill Cosby is a human being. He's complex. Don't it does not dim his brilliance as a as an artist, as a comedian, as a storyteller, as an actor. I still embrace that because that's our problem is that we don't know how to. I mean, I don't want to speak like our problem to no black folks. We got to embrace and pick our heroes and heroes. You know, because, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you look at all these movies, these big-budget movies, yeah, because there's a lot of money and resources and, and hoopla behind it don't mean it's the truth. And we all know that with the movie Exodus and so many other movies that come out of Hollywood. So well, my thing yeah. is this is, like, if black if white folks would say we could make a movie about killing the sitting head of a state, like, you know, Kim Jong-un, and people going to get away with it, then we could make a movie, we could make our own reality saying that, hey, we as a, as black folks, we got the power uh, to be the captain and the commander of our destiny. And me as just an individual, I have the power to veto what you want my reality to be. I can veto it and create my own bill for my reality. Mm-hmm. I can be the politician of my destiny. Oh, what the hell I'm talking about? This, this is getting late. But, uh, no, <laughs> but, no. but, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, because I'll be saying, like, why people... Um, why do you, why do people say that like you can't be racist? Somebody told me that uh, black people can't be racist, and I was thinking that was disempowering. Cause like, I mean, I would love like I would love to think I could be racist. Like you know, I had the option. Like it was. Yeah, um, I understand what you say. Like, like yeah, it was like a twenty three year old. It was like twenty three year old white dude on the subway, and he was like begging for money, and I and I thought I had some type of power by not giving him money, but deciding to give maybe an older black lady some yeah. money. So I thought I was being racist, but I thought that was. You know, I was cool with that. I was like, oh, I guess I'm racist. But then somebody tried to tell me I wasn't racist. And I was like, oh, you, you're disempowering my uh, my racist acts right now. I wasn't cool with that. But still, uh, I, you know what? And that's deep what you're saying because it, until we can be racist, then we're not really equal in the system. Until black folks have the ability to be racist in the system, but you created your own value system. So in your own value system, because you are the master and commander of your destiny, because you are the center of your universe, you can be racist because you create the value system. You create the code of ethics. So you took yourself out of their universe and created your own framework. So if you want to be a racist, you can be a racist. Right. Okay. So, I mean, like, you don't limit yourself to that. And then why I tell people that they don't, you know, I saw the documentary, the Illmatic documentary. It was powerful because Nas Daddy said something that was very powerful. He basically told his sons that the system don't mean you any good, so drop out of school. So Nas dropped out of the eighth grade, right? He didn't go into high school. And he said, you know, he got calls from his, you know, Nas' father is a famous jazz musician in his own right. He comes from a long line of musicians. I mean, Nas got that in his pedigree. But his father told him that the system is trying to destroy black men and that he don't see how he could let his son spend another day in school as being a conscious black man, you know, Allowing his son to be destroyed mentally and spiritually by the system. Because as bright as Nas is, they try to put him in special education classes in school. This guy is brilliant. Oh, you know well. what I'm saying? 
Yeah, he got a, you know, you know, Harvard, they, they, they worship Nas. You know, those saying, like, we come for those type of people, man. It's like, we have the ability to shift the paradigm. That's why things get changed up when, when black folks, when we want to march on something, when we want to move on something. When, uh, not all, see, it seems like it's not about all of us getting together. It's about that. Let's say you and I want to work together. Like when LeBron James say, I'm going to work, I'm going to go down to Miami and win some championships with, with Chris Bosh and D-Wade. That scared the hell out of white supremacy. Even though he was playing in their game, he changed the game on the people that controlled the game. He rewrote the rules of the game. And, you know, and, he, and that was a dynamic power shift. We well, had this one team that really was dominating for four years. They won two out of four championships. But to go four consecutive years on a championship run, that's impressive, no matter who, no matter who we, you are in. But you, we as black folks, when we decide to do something, when we want to move, the world will listen. The world actually stops and listens to what we're doing because there's something about us. You know what I'm saying? Like the the ancestors who who came over here, because you already had black folks over in America. So when you talk about Native Americans, they look like us. Uh, but the black folks they brought from Africa, they wasn't still in just you know ignorant black people. They were still in the scientists, the engineers, the architects. The, the educators, you were like the folks that were caught up in tribal warfare that were captured and traded by their enemies until this hell known as slavery, as we know it. But you had the smartest of the smartest coming over here. You was no dumb. They were carpenters. They built things. They grew things. Like, you look at Thomas Edison, and I'll let you go. I know, you got, I know it's getting late. But Thomas Edison had a whole factory of black folks working for him, inventing things. Like, Louis Latimer... He invented the filament yeah, for the light yeah, bulb, know, Lewis and he designed the phone for Alexander Graham Bell. And you look at the guy with a $10 bill. That's a black guy. They made him white on a $10 bill. Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of Treasury, he set the money system in this country. He was from the Alexander. Wait, 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 Alexander Hamilton was black? Yeah, he was black. And his mom was black. He was from the Alexander. This, this brother was dark. His brothers could not pass. Alexander Hamilton was lighting up the pass. So if you look at portraits of him, not on a ten dollar bill. And you look at the people, how did his contemporaries how to describe him. He had nappy hair and broad lips and a big nose. He didn't look like the picture on a ten dollar bill. He was a captain in George Washington's army. And he was a brilliant, you know, ec- economist. And he created the money system in this country. He created the treasury. You know? So that's a that's a that's a black man. But you know, but if you don't know their history They'll make everybody black. They're like, I mean, I mean, everybody white, like they did in the Exodus. You know, Moses was black. You know, and the Egyptians were black. Moses' wife was black. So I'm saying, like, that happened in Africa. So how can everybody be, like, pale and white if this happened in Africa? That's a dark-skinned people land. That's a melanated people's land. But I'm not here to talk about supremacy or whatnot. That's, that's mother nature. But what I am talking about is the fact that like that instant you just described about being on the train and decide to give your money to a black woman instead of a white man, that's power. You recognize that you had power to control the outcome of a situation. And in that context, you could be whatever you want to be because you create the, mm-hmm. you create the reality by giving somebody money over not giving another person money for what reason. So you took back some power, man. You stood on your own. It took back some power. So that's power. You know, and like what you're doing with your art and stuff like that, you're creating your own reality. You're manifesting what you want to happen. You're making your dreams a reality. You know, you're making your life into your own movie. You're creating the theme mm-hmm. for your movie. You're creating the soundtrack for your movie. Like you said, this is the show, and it's all the way live. Hey. Bro, Quad, you got any closing thoughts you want to share? I don't keep it on, man. I really enjoy talking to you. Do you have anything else you want yeah, to add? No, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Um. If you know, if I if if I die and uh, what you call it, they um they decide to make a movie, just make sure they uh they cast the black dude for Quasi Fafo. That's all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're gonna make it happen. We're gonna be the evidence. They got to have the. They're gonna see the shows. All the seasons. <laughs> Well, Brother Quasi, I want to thank you, cousin. Um, in the words of Greg Dugan, I think we love you madly. Keep on producing and pushing, and I'll see you sometime in the very, very near future. 
in the future installment of one of your shows. Hey, no doubt. Be smooth, cuz. You too, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. No problem. And that does it for this edition of We All Be Radio, but we'll be back for some more stuff. We're going to end out 2014 in a very loud and profound bang in a big, good way, a good big bang. No bad bang bangs. <laughs> so, uh, until next time, family, take care and peace out.